Okay, so I think the plan is we're gonna revisit some of these cuts that Lee has pulled off of the subprimals. And we're gonna look at, you know, different approaches for how they can be used based on the market, based on the process, you know, the, whatever skills the processor has or the way the processor likes to roll. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about like, yeah, why you guys do what you do, what, what like, why it has meaning to you. Um, but Lee, tell us where you want to start. Like, what are we going to look at first? Did you want to take a look at this Let's knuckle? Let's do the knuckle. Okay. So this is right here, remember. This is your quadricep muscle, essentially, a group of them on the front of the, front of the shin. Um, this is uh, probably, once you peel this, it's called a peeled knuckle. This is uh, something that you probably see sliced into sirloin tip steaks. Um, it's not sirloin tip. It That's is. what they call it when they want to get more money out of it. Yeah, exactly. At my shop, we used to actually salt it and put a bunch of spicy chili on it and smoke it whole and then slice it thin for customers to make sandwiches out of. People freaked out about it. It's great for... It's really good. It's great for little minute steaks because once you get rid of some of these seams, there's some really nice uh, pieces of uh, lobes of meat in there that can be cross-cut to nice either thin steaks, like minute steaks, or even cube steaks. Um, yeah, you've got, you got options with it. It's uh, very versatile. When I was growing up uh, at the butcher block, working there, they make this stuff called tiger meat. Does anyone know what tiger meat is? Anyone from North Dakota, South Dakota? Oh yeah, we got one over there. You got one? Is it? <laughs> so tiger meat is essentially like a steak tartare type preparation where they chop up onions and garlic and peppers, and they grind it all up, and uh, it's just like, it just reminds me of home. <laughs> it's, you put it on crackers and it's just some tasty stuff. So it's typically done with a real lean cut like this where we peel out these knuckles and grind those through to make it. But I'll kind of show you what they look like once we open up and do a little seaming on this. Oh, we need a mic for Jamie. What are you doing with the knuckles? Is this on? Okay. Um, typically like wholesale, our, our knuckles are going out as like brazing cuts. Like they're basically brazing them down. Most okay. of our chefs are. You said that uh, Sean Sherman was buying some, something from you and making a ceviche. It's kind of yeah. like tiger meat, right? Uh, like, do you remember, what, was, it, was it top rounds or what was it? Top rounds, top okay, so rounds. not knuckle, different cut. Yeah, okay. it was top rounds he was using, I think. But yeah, he was doing like a ceviche with it. That's so cool. It's kind of cool, yeah. Yeah. So you're cutting this into steaks. A couple steaks here uh -huh. just to kind of show you what the profile of those are. They certainly, at a glance, look like they would be a sirloin, but they're not. They don't taste like it. They um, can be tenderized. They're great as tenderized steaks. Um, and to, to take it even further, you can see this very pronounced separation here. Right? Can you see that? <laughs> Am I showing you the wrong? There we go. There we go. There we go. There's this. We're going to split down right there, and you're going to see that you actually get, you can get a, a smaller, nice, round steak like this. This is great for tenderizing, marinating, things like that. So it doesn't have to be cut into the difference between this and the difference between this. So there's, you know, definitely like a budget option here, and then it, it offers you the flexibility for portion control that other cuts don't. So, that center muscle I found is so tender. Very like, tender. Oh, you almost can't marinate it. It yeah. like it does. It's almost too much for it. Um, so if you have the option, you can pull that out and sell a very tender cut or eat a very tender cut. Um, so okay, that's sirloin tip. What else do we want to get into? Um, did you want to pull the heel apart? Let's do that. Please here. So for you, for for you're pulling off the. Sure the knuckle, you're pulling off the top yeah. and the bottom, and then the heel's going into grind, or? Yeah, I think typically the heels are going into grind. Mm -hmm. There's some really flavorful meat down in there. A lot of, lot of um, action, a lot of activity. So you're probably having to pull off a lot of connective tissue right now, mm -hmm. huh? I always find it easier to kind of get the peel, uh, you know, peel things while the muscle's whole. It gives you a little weight to work with. It's like interesting just, to see you doing so much trim work with that big knife, the seminar there. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen butchers do that before with beef. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, this I, I use my boning knife for that, but. I pretty much use like boning knife for uh, intricate like seam work and yeah. um, joint work. Um, but I find a nice straight edge is, it helps keep. Uh, That's probably why you're faster than me. <laughs> that and like a bunch of other reasons. Bigger knife. I feel like a, a larger knife gives you a little bit better of a straight edge if you're yeah. really looking for nice clean angles. Um, but we're going to peel this little guy out of here. You just give me a moment. So what are you after right now? Like what are you we're doing? Gonna, we're going to dig out a, a kind of a cool little very tender flavorful muscle that um, some people call a velvet steak. It's got different names but Merlot steak is a very common Term it's another it. like little single serving exactly. little piece it's of part, deliciousness. It's part of the gastrocnemius uh, muscle, which is calf muscle. And um, it just happens to be buried in some connective tissue that you really wouldn't think there's something that tender lurking underneath the surface. But with a little bit of careful trimming, you can really get it. Get a nice uh, steak out of it. You ever had a buffalo Merlot steak? Never. No, me either. That's how we get Joe Rogan to rep your company. I don't know. Cinema. I'm trying to figure that one out. Yeah, we don't want, we actually don't want that, do we? <laughs> so it's kind of coming out of the center of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to kind of peel all this connect tissue off. And as you can see, when we're doing this, like, you really need to decide with your operation Am I getting my money back on this labor, right? Am, am I, uh, I going to get anything out of this? That's, that's, in terms of retail anyway, that's really kind of the bottom line where you've, uh, you end up doing a lot of extra work on it to sell. You know, you just got to base your value added on that because um, that's a whole thing as a part of it. So do you cut this in your shop? Like, is it worth it for you? Most of the time it isn't. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'd like to do a lot more of it, but uh, for the most part, a lot of people just aren't interested in that type of stuff. So. Uh -huh. um, we, we do other things, though, for value added, like once we get into the top round and stuff that we can kind of talk about where you got options. And Jamie probably has uh, the best information on things like uh, what to do with round in terms of how do you make some money on that stuff. People don't want to buy a round steak for two bucks a pound. I think we lost one. Sorry, guys. And so customers, like for either one of you, customers are, are they asking for stuff like this? Or is this something that you would cut if someone asked you to? I suppose we would. I'd probably have to have a come to Jesus talk with my butcher because he would give me a dirty look. <laughs> what the hell are we cutting up for? He might be not very happy with you. I mean, we're, we try to, especially on the custom stuff, you know, we try to, we try to cut to their wishes as much as we can. That makes sense. So I wonder if this is a good place to talk about, you know, obviously there's a lot of opportunity, there are different opportunities for somebody like you, Lee, with a retail shop, you've got a certain customer base coming in, they're buying more single cuts, cooking cuts, and then you're working with wholesale customers, so the way that you approach the carcass is gonna be different. And I guess um, it feels important to talk about like what, motivate, what motivated you to move into retail, what motivated you to provide this service to the community, um, like I guess reasons of your own, but then also reasons for the community. Right? Yeah, you know, moving to Lawrence, Kansas is college town, and um, I went to school at, you know, moved to Lawrence to go to school at Haskell, Indian Nations University, and I had come from like working at a butcher shop, and I assumed there'll be some place where I could get a job, maybe cutting meat, and um, I just noticed that there was a big kind of just a hole where it's, there should have been something. And, um, and you know, a, a lot of people, I would talk to a lot of people who are looking for processors. They're looking for anyone who, like, I can do the kill. Can you just do the custom processing on it for me? And, and I started saying no so much to people. I just started, it made me realize, like, what, we need to figure out a way to say yes and serve, serve this community in a better way. Um, and that really was the, the, the main inspiration for it. Um, my background is in retail, uh, but I've been in the restaurant business almost my whole life. And so when it came time to build the brand and try to tell our story, um, we decided that because whole animal can be, you have, you know, a lot of stuff that doesn't fit into a case, 
and this might not fit into a case, or you know, it, it won't sell, so what do you do? What's your game plan? Um, so I own a little sausage restaurant. We grind all the beef for our burgers that we serve there. All the sausages are made in-house. That's kind of my specialty. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wanted to be able to have an outlet for that. Honestly, selfish reasons too. I missed being able to go to the butcher shop like I did growing up as a kid. Um, when I had the smoker going and we're making sausage and we're cutting meat in there, people walk in and they say, oh, it smells amazing in here. And it just reminds me of my childhood because that was like one of the main things when you walk into the butcher block, it just has that smell. And um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of the main reason. Uh, we've partnered with a lot of other uh, local nonprofits to provide you know, like just food in our in our small towns, a uh, 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 food bank that we work with for donations and things like that, and um, trying to develop uh, classes that we can like extension through Haskell for possibly training and business courses and things like that. So we're using it as a conduit to outreach to the community, which is super appropriate for a town like Lawrence, right, yeah. and the customer base there. And maybe I want to get to this question for you too, but maybe introduce like what you're going to do next first. Okay. Um, you can be cutting while we're talking about. How, how about I clean up this flat? This came off the gooseneck from the um, eye of round. Remember when we separated these? Sorry. Yeah, that way. Okay. And so, so what we, are you going to do with that? We separated these and then what, what I'll do is we'll trim this back and we'll show you the, how this kind of turns into just a, a, like a blank palette for however you want to treat it because okay. there's a lot of applications for a big square cut of meat like this. I know you're using this too, right? For jerky? For jerky, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Westside Meats and Cheyenne, Cheyenne uh, River Buffalo Company because you also, it seems like you've been really responsive to the community as well, but in a different way. So you want to talk about what you're doing with that, with both the buffalo and the, and the processing facility? Yeah, we have a couple different uh, ventures, I guess you'd call them. Um, we're actively in a farm to school program, bringing buffalo and locally sourced beef into our five reservation schools. Uh, we also worked with some local ranchers to do some beef to school, where basically the ranchers are donating the beef, we're doing the processing, the school just is picking up the cost of the processing. So it, it makes it it's not the best deal for the rancher, but it, it is a great deal for our kids. And, you know, we're hoping once, once farm to school goes full blown, we're going to actually be able to pay these guys for, for these animals that they're so graciously donating right now. Um, I think it goes to speak a lot of uh, maybe our Midwestern values that, you know, they're willing to donate a, you know, $1,500, $1,600 animal to make sure that the kids have something good to eat you know that's uh with the with the buffalo you know yeah. we donate oh anywhere from 15 to 20 animals a year uh for ceremonial uses for um, funerals um about anything you can imagine i guess uh, we we don't turn too many people away if they have a need we we try to help them out so i mean that's that's a lot of what we're trying to do. I think at the end of the day, you know, our, our, our biggest goal is to is preserve our, our culture with the bison, with the buffalo. Um, I call them bison once in a while because I went to Singapore and on a food show deal, kind of exploring the market for buffalo over there. And I quickly found out that when you say buffalo in Asia, they think you're talking about water buffalo. Uh -huh. <laughs> And that's sacred cow, and if they're not looking at it as sacred cow, then it's like the poor man's beef, poor man's meat. And actually, in some countries, they even use it as a derogatory term. Like, if you're being dumb, they call you a buffalo. So I quickly learned that you don't call it that over there. So I, I have to catch myself. I go back and forth, but I'm talking about the same thing. But um, I, don't know, I kind of lost track where I was at, but... That's okay. That's, um, um, yeah, there's know. a lot in what you're saying. Like, I, so first of all, the, with the kids. Yeah. When I talked to you before, you were talking about how the kids really could tell the difference. Oh, I, I tell you, it was just, and, and this is on the beef. So, with our farm to school, we did um, we introduced some local beef into the schools, and 
uh, different ways. And then we started the donated beef thing. So we kind of had the idea of let's just kind of blind push it into the school lunch and not really tell the kids that it's something different. So I worked with the school at Timberlake, South Dakota. And, um, the first time they did it, they made, I think, cheeseburgers or hamburgers. And the superintendent said that the kids were coming up to him afterwards, like, them were the best burgers we've ever had here, you know. And, and uh, that was pretty cool. But the second time they did it, they made spaghetti with it, which you wouldn't think would be quite as obvious, right? But he said when he started asking the kids about it, it was the same response, like, ah, they did something different. That spaghetti was so good, you know, and the only thing they did different was use locally processed and grown and raised beef. You know, we did another kind of cool thing is, like, we, we uh, kind of tracked, like, how far this animal has traveled in its life. Now, if you buy stuff at the grocery store, you would probably be scared to know how many thousands of miles that animal has traveled in its life. Those, those beef that we fed at Timberlake had been on, had traveled a total from ranch to processing to the school, 60 miles. That's amazing. That was- yeah, and I think even just like what you're doing at the processing facility to keep Westside Meats going is a really huge service. I was talking to some, some ranchers at the break that go to, have to go to three different processing facilities just to get all their meat. Um, handled, right? So the people who are willing to do the work of that you're doing, I think right. it's, it's uh, hard for, for the average person to understand how hard that work is to do, how much regulation is involved, and, but how, yet how important it is to keeping the supply chain intact. And, and you know, I mean, honestly, from a business sense, the, the custom processing is not the greatest uh, return, if you want to call it that. I mean, you're not going to make tons and tons of money, but you're going to get customers that are going to come back year after year after year. You know, we're kind of old school, like we have cutting cards. They're like basically recipe cards where, you know, Lee brings in a beef and this is how thick he wants his steaks. And, and uh, you know, we have cutting cards that I would say have probably been in there for 30 years from some of those people. And, you know, it might be one beef a year, it might be two, but... I mean, you can almost count on it. They're going to be back year after year after year. And so, I mean, they, they really build some loyalty to you. So uh, it, it's, a good, it's a good business model. Like I say, it's not, you're, you're not going to get rich doing it. But uh, we try to back that up with our, our retail side. Yeah. And we're still not getting rich. But, you know, it's uh, things, that, things are getting brighter all the time, I guess, mm. you know. It's building yeah. all the time. And COVID, I think, showing us that the reason for this is bigger than business. It's food sovereignty, right? So what, what yeah. that's providing for the community there. You know, COVID, if COVID did anything positive, I think it, it brought our country back to, you know, understanding the value of where your food comes from. Uh, you know, there's, you saw, saw it probably yourselves or you heard about people going into their Walmart and there being no meat on the shelves. And, and as meat processors, what we saw was just this tremendous influx of people uh, coming in and uh, wanting to fill freezers and buying halves of beef. And, you know, it's, it's created some, some new opportunities for ranchers to, to, to sell quarters and halves nice. and whole animals. But it, it created a few challenges for processors too because all of a sudden you had first time buyers in that market. Right. So you'd get the guys that would come in and say, you know, I want, how you want it cut? Well, I want uh, T-bones and I want New York strips and I want, and you're like, well, okay, back up a little bit, you know, yeah. you, you can have one or the other. Thank you. And, uh, or you'd get the guy that comes in and says, uh, oh, my cousin told me I should get 80 ribeye steaks off of this half a beef and stuff like that. So. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, it created some challenges and just that learning curve, but uh, it was good for the industry and, and it really did. Like, I think local foods has a whole new uh, value to, to America and that's good for us as ranchers, producers, as processors, businesses um, in this economy. And I, I just think it's going to keep growing. Yeah. I also just... 
the amount of money that's being thrown at the processing sector right now in agriculture. It's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds, but really shined a light on the fact that the bottlenecks in the processing sector that we saw during COVID were not a new thing, right? right. <laughs> but it just highlighted that it was there, and um, hope, hopefully folks are getting more support. It's something we always knew was there. Yeah. But, yeah. you know. So, Lee, what's going on over here? All right. I've been working. You've been uh, working. <laughs> so, we went ahead and separated our flat bottom round, and um, this has got potential for a lot of cuts, but I just wanted everyone to see when it's cleaned up you kind of have a nice long tri uh, rectangular piece of, of meat to work with that can do a lot of things, everything from jerkies to steaks. You can tie roast out of this, stew meat, things like that. It works really great. This is also something that if you do prefer a really lean ground, this works. Uh, I know Jamie was saying that like round on bison is really dark, so he tries to avoid a lot of that just for the dark color. Um, so you do have to be careful because color will change as you get further into the round. The eye of round, I kept a little bit of that fat cap on. If you wanted to roast that, tie it. Um, it's great smoked for smoked meat. Um, just if yeah, we you... had some questions about eye of round in the break. What, what do you do with it? How do you get your customers to buy it? Oh. Things like that. Uh, eye of round, I have a uh, funny relationship with the old eye of round. Okay, not the best one to answer this question then, <laughs> Maybe <huh>? not. <laughs> I personally think it is an overrated... Um, I think it's kind of an overrated cut of meat. It doesn't offer a lot in terms of value anymore because the prices have gone up on it. It is good for cer certain applications. Like I use this for like a type of deli meat that I make out of it. Um, like I said, with dried beef or smoked beef, it's really good. If you're, if you're into salumi and whole muscle, this is a great whole muscle to, to cure. Yeah, I'm in the business of teaching people how to cure, cure muscles with, with salt. So I think that's really, for whole muscle, it's a really easy thing to do. You can pass that on to your customers. What about you? I have round. Like uh, like on the on the buffalo, yeah. our eye rounds all What's go into value added into jerky. Jerky. Yep. Yeah, which is delicious. If you haven't tried this jerky, it's amazing. Yeah, um, it's uh, you know, it's a way. Even with shrinkage, you know, we're taking a seven dollar a pound cut of meat on a buffalo, and even with our shrinkage, we're able to wholesale that out for almost twenty eight dollars a pound. So. And is that something that you can do for other producers, like other people's meats, or like a, oh, yeah. like a rancher in this room is like, I don't have a Jamie in my community. How do I get jerky? Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we do some custom stuff. I mean, I think Lee can tell you, and you know as well. Like when you start talking about sausage making and recipes, and you know, people are pretty, you know, pretty tight lipped. But we we do have some like they call them white label agreements. So we we. We manufacture, we ship out in bulk, and we allow them to repackage our product. So, I mean, we do some of that, and yeah, I mean, we're 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 in business, so we're open to, I guess, protecting the integrity of our recipe. Or, you know, I'm sure Lee's not going to tell you what his <laughs> best sausage recipe is. It's just but, a little salt and pepper, yeah, and that's yeah, it. Yeah. So Happy to tell you. But yeah, you know, we we do some of that. As well, you know, the white label stuff and the custom, like, we do a lot of jerkies and sausages with our wild game customers. You know, they want deer jerky, they want antelope, and elk. So we do a lot of that just for, you know, not for resale, just for yeah, their yeah, own Yeah, perfect. Use. Yeah, custom processing, right? And so uh, another thing we wanted to, that looks beautiful, Lee. Can you want to talk about what's on the board right there? Okay, so this is a, when we did the sirloin, when we did the sirloin, um, that had a butt tender attached to it. I don't know if you remember when I mentioned it. Sometimes they leave that attached. Um, kind of the savvier packers are going to keep those and they're going to box those and sell those at a slightly discount from their standard Pismos. This is a tenderloin. This is a psoas major muscle, um, the most tender muscle I actually think the pectineus muscle is slightly, I think, Ooh. maybe slightly more tender. <laughs> but this, this one here is what everyone thinks about filet mignon. This side, the, the butt of where this butts up into, tucks up underneath the leg, um, is typically a lower cost form of tenderloin. And it makes an, a more affordable, you know, fancier steak. But you can tie this and roast this into like a Chateaubriand, slice that. 
It's a really great preparation. It's very tender um, and, and a more affordable option. If you are getting, if you are a cutter and you're getting steam ships and you're breaking down primals and they have these attached, you are very lucky because you're just paying for the round, you know, and you're getting a nice little value added chunk. Um, this is the culotte that we pulled off earlier. It's been cleaned up. Fat side stays on. And in fact, in South America, you'll see fat cap. It's absurd. Um, and uh, the way that they're cut, I know, I know a Brazilian guy who told me, you would think that you could stake this across and this is all picanha, but it's not. There's a few little like veins in here. And if you press on the meat and massage the meat, you'll actually see a tiny little bit of plasma come out of them. And where you want is this first one here. And you face that halfway between and you cut that off. While this is the exact same knife cut away from this, this tastes different than this in steak form. So then you can go through and stake out your picanhas, picanha steaks. And like I said, you get about three, three and a half, depending on, they're not large. You know, they're almost the shape of like a small strip. Um, what a lot of people do, will skewer them with the fat cap out like this. And you can either grill them like that, rotisserie works really well is what you'll typically see, and then you can slice them in this way. They're very tender, very flavorful. South America, this is the most expensive cut of meat. So just kind of a, a little uh, difference in regional and cultural um, methods. How about nice. that? Oh, this little guy here, <laughs> this is a mouse muscle. This is the gluteus accessorius muscle, and it is a very overlooked muscle, very tender, very tasty. Um, I serve a relatively older clientele uh, where I, I got a guy that comes in, he goes and jogs, and then he comes in in his jogging gear and he wants to buy one of these for his lunch, and that's what oh, he wow. does. Every, you know, he's like, every time I got one of these in the case, I pretty much put his name on it. But this is also one of those cuts that, uh, for a quick steak, steak and eggs, a steak sandwich, you can cut this really quickly into stir fry meat. It's tender. It's surrounded with stuff that is not edible, really. But once you get to the heart of it, there's two of these in there. This one is really the main one that we, that we try to merchandise. The rest of it will go into our, our grind. Um, and then can, I can we talk a little bit more about your customers? Like, I'm sorry. like who your customers are? And, and are you serving na native customers as well as non-native folk? What are yeah. the perceptions that each are bringing into the shop? And you know... Um, it, uh, since we have uh, Haskell Indian Nations University in town, uh, we do see a lot of Haskell family that comes in and supports us. Um, and then we also do collaborations with them. So we'll be providing uh, food and meat cuts and expertise for their events, fundraising events and things like that. Um, you know, across the board, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out who, who our customer is and what they want. And I really try to tailor the type of cutting that we do and what we carry um, with them in mind, uh, I think it's easy to say, I'm going to go and open this business and I'm going to run it my way and this way because that's the way that I like it. And it lasts for a little while, but then as soon as you start hearing some of that feedback, you'd be foolish to not listen to what people want. So we, uh, I would love to be able to seam cut and sell mouse muscle, these little pieces in different ways. Um, and the reality is, is that we haven't done a good enough job educating our customers about what the options are. Um, and a lot of that goes back to efficiencies. Um, labor is, <laughs> labor is uh, something else. It's just uh, harder and harder to find people that can do this. Um, I have one full-time butcher and she is total badass. She can do everything and she, um, but she's been with me for six years. Uh, it takes a long time. It starts really slow and, and then before you can start tackling larger things or beef, we start out with small things. Um, it's it, it, people who do lambs. Lambs are a little bit more manageable. Beef is a little aggressive. So I don't recommend people just diving into beef if they're interested, you know, uh, go in on a hog with somebody. Um, you know, and I actually help a lot of people locate animals that are willing to, starting to do processing on their own throughout the community, natives and whites alike. A lot of people are looking at raising animals. The problem with that, I think, I think all that is great. The only problem is, is that we have such a bottleneck in our processing facilities that uh, most people are booked out a year and a half in advance in our region. So uh, a group of us uh, from Douglas County are actually working on our next phase 
to open a processing facility, a USDA plant, and a co-packing facility. Um, but that's a few years off yet. But we're just getting the ball rolling on that. And we've get, been getting some good feedback from the public on it. So That's great. I think there's, you and I have also talked about like that retail culture. Like people walk into a shop. First of all, butcher shops coming back onto the scene is like relatively newer. It's like a harking back to another age when that part of the supply chain was intact. It was a separate person. They had a specific role of educating. And now it's like, oh, this is so like hipster or whatever, right. quote unquote. Yeah. But, and, and not really like, oh, I can step into this space and expect to be educated. It's almost like people don't want to not know, right? So they walk through the door and they're like, okay, I'm just going to go for what I know. Mm -hmm. I'm a little shy. I'm not going to ask questions. So kind of allowing the retail butcher to like assume that role and be that educator. Right. I think it's something that as a whole, like we're still just like kind of walking slowly back into. Yeah. But you just being there, I think, is what's setting the stage for that a little bit. Yeah, we, we really try to focus on um, the approach to how things are going to get treated when they leave the store. Uh, we offer cooking uh, like uh, instructions and different techniques that people might not be familiar with, including things as simple as getting inexpensive thermometers and you know, because you really don't want to send someone down the line and say, wow, that's a really great steak, and then they go home, and they don't know what to do, or they poke at it, and they think it's done. They don't know if it's done, and then they get it on the plate, and it's not what they want it to be. So that sucks for us as much as it sucks for you guys. And so we really want to prevent as much of that as possible. If people leave and they feel like they haven't been given the tools and the knowledge that they need to, to, to cook those things properly and to enjoy them and to get some value out of them, then we've uh, completely failed in our mission. So we, we take that pretty seriously, and we're trying to uh, open people's minds about some of these other cuts. And that it doesn't happen unless you let people know what it is, how to cook it, what it tastes good with, give people examples, give people, send them uh, links to YouTube, you know, things like that. We really try to focus on some of the education things. And um, in the future, we're going to be hosting classes and cooking classes at the shops. That's so. really great. I think it's important to remember that that's the butcher's role, right? That right now, a farmer's kind of carrying all of that. You know, I was talking to those ladies in the break. They're like, yeah, we got to do all this education in addition to raising the animals. But having folks like Lee in communities and like you being able to work with ranchers, specifically native ranchers, can you talk about that? Like the opportunities that you see for, for putting native product in front of communities like Lawrence? Yeah, I think the sky's the limit. I think that nobody has come up with a really good way to, to model that, you know, and, you know, that's something that we've been working on uh, for a while with, like, local bison herds, and, and it's, um, it's, that's been one of the challenges, honestly. Um, you know, we, we'd like to do more, uh, but it's, uh, on the retail side of things, what makes it difficult is, you know, we, we live in ribeye country there, and so I, you know, I have to carry middle cuts to keep people happy about things, and so it's, it's a, I've, I've just come to terms with the fact that it ta it's going to change slowly. Yeah. Um, I think the shift in, in the pricing of meat and things like that, those, those are going to change people's perceptions just by necessity. Um, and I, you know, I live in a town with a you know, there's people who don't bat an eye at spending $20 a pound on ribeye or 30 for tenderloin or whatever it happens to be. And uh, I have, you know, have that available. But the things that I like, things that get me up in the morning are finding these little morsels of meat, finding ways, a different preparation for them so they can, you know, utilize something that isn't just a steak or just a roast or a crock pot item. Nothing wrong with any of that, but there's so much more. It gets people more involved. Um, and then the utilization of, you know, the yield of this animal and its utilization, you know, that is a, a that, that's just the native value in general where when we, when we're growing up, we kept everything, we cooked everything, the lungs and the liver and everything. And, um, you know, like we've kind of gone away from a lot of that stuff. And I feel like the more people know about it, the more willing they are to try some of those things. And maybe we won't have so many drop weights on our animals. <laughs> Maybe people will start buying Oregon meat again. I, I don't know. Um, but it starts small, and it's our job to, to really, you know, tell people about it. Nice. Sorry for making you talk so much when you're trying to cut a piece of meat. <laughs> what, is this the top this inside is, round? Yep, top, this inside round, top round, uh, top side if, on the British terminology. I like to clean off a lot of this excess fat before 
we get down into the heart of it. So uh, I'm going to talk to Jamie a little bit about customers, but do you want to tell us really quick what your end goal is with this? Cut right here. Um, so as far as like what I would do with it yeah. as a shot, this is our roast beef that we do. We um, peel the uh, round, the inside round heart muscle. We pull all of this stuff off, um, and which you can actually stake into different pieces here. This cap has got a lot of flavor. It's, there's a lot going on here. It's got a very pronounced grain to it. It's almost like a skirt steak, huh? A little bit, and it can be rolled and, uh, and, and is very, very tasty. In terms of beef flavor, it's got some of the best beef flavor in this part of the critter. This is gonna ache. Nice. So I'm just kind of uh, cleaning up on the outside, and we'll try to get this cap peeled a little bit before we start hacking into it. All righty. Uh, so Jamie, are you, you were telling me that you have a lot of indigenous buyers for the product, for your wholesale product? Yeah, we, we do. I mean, I'm, probably our best clients are indigenous chefs, like Mariah, Chris, I don't know if you guys saw Crystal, I think she was doing some stuff today, Sean Sherman, Ben Jacobs. I mean, those are some of our our best clients right now, and it's really gone a long way to like throwing us into mainstream, into uh, brand recognition. I guess that's probably the best way to term yeah. it. So we're we're starting to starting to to feel some of that brand recognition, like Shine River Buffalo. Oh yeah, I, I've heard of you guys. So um, you know, you get you get a client list with Sean Sherman on it. You can't go wrong. He he, I don't know if you guys heard his NPR uh, broadcast he did here a month or so ago, but he uh, he name dropped us on that NPR deal. Awesome. And I, I think later that day I got like three phone calls like, how do I order your guys' meat? So, so yeah, I mean it's it's been great for us, and they're they're some of the best clients we have right now. That's awesome. It's got to feel good. Yeah, and then you were talking also about like. Um, some of the big accounts that you're picking up with non-native folk and can you talk a little bit about what that means especially being in in an area where there's so much buffalo for you to be uh getting those accounts and maybe making those sales yeah so we just recently partnered with uh they're called uh, dakota butcher they're probably the largest butcher shop chain kind of small chain in south dakota uh he has seven shops right now and by the time he's done, he's going to have nine. He's in like five or six grocery stores. And, and he actually, he had bought some product for us before. And he was making snack sticks and things like that with him. And he approached us uh, earlier this fall about, you know, kind of partnering up. And he, would, he wanted to start um, marketing our brand as a South Dakota brand. And um, yeah, I, I, I think... What, uh, what really made me feel good is because, I mean, the buffalo meat industry in South Dakota is very competitive. I mean, there are literally, I, I don't know, I, I, there's at least half a dozen pretty big name buffalo meat companies in South Dakota. And to have a non-native largest company reach out to us as the ones he wanted to partner with, but I thought it was, was pretty cool. And it kind of kind of made me feel like we are kind of breaking through into that next level, I guess, as a business. You know, the brand recognition, the, you know, the thing that, that we have as, as a native company that none of the non-native companies have is we have the story. We don't have to make it up. I mean, they're, they're fabricating our story, but I mean, our, our emergence story, everything, surrounds the buffalo. We're the buffalo nation. I mean, we know more about this animal than anybody. So um, in the right markets, that story has a lot of value. It may not necessarily be in South Dakota, but I think it's maybe more so than I thought, honestly. So yeah, yeah. it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, and, and, and you're seeing opportunities also for like, I mean, it's easy to sit at these events, right, and be in the audience and be like, oh, well, that's what Jamie did. Great, great. Could I do the same thing, right? Like, is there opportunity for other native ranchers who are moving into buffalo production, beef production, to be, re to be realizing these same types of, you know, recognition or, or, or sales or... Oh, absolutely. I, I, there's, there's, like, 
there's some big things on the horizon, you know, and, and I, I can't, you know, there's some legislation, legislative stuff that is really going to push the buffalo industry and specifically native-owned buffalo industry into the next tier of, of opportunity. And, you know, um, we, we, want, we want to be the facilitator for that, you know. And if we can bring other folks along, ITBC just recently partnered with USDA to put out a, a guide on uh, transitioning from cattle to buffalo. So if you guys get a chance that, and you're interested, that's a really neat um, kind of a manual or a roadmap, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, there's just a lot of opportunity. And, and um, you know, we're not just on the buffalo side. We're a buffalo company, but we're in beef cattle country too. So... You know, and we can advance that as well. So we're, we're hoping that this is a kind of a domino effect and it creates all kinds of new opportunities and institutional contracts. And, you know, we're starting to look at things that we've never looked at before, like, you know, land-grant universities. Why, why isn't South Dakota's land-grant universities serving home-raised native buffalo meat in their student unions? I mean, we're starting to look at things like that. And, trying to get into those markets. And those are, those are kind of like untapped, untapped areas for us as a business. So um, they, they represent a huge potential. And, you know, like I said, I mean, we, we would just love to be the facilitator. And if other tribes want to participate, individuals want to participate, you know, hey, we're, we want to advance everybody. When, when awesome. one native succeeds, we all succeed, I think. Yeah. You know? Way to blaze that trail, I think. And I, I, Lee, I've heard you speak to this as well, just feeling like there's a lot of opportunities to tell the story. You have any thoughts yeah. on that? Sorry, I was working. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like telling the story of like native producers through your shop or through the work of, of doing meat education in general, right? Like you said earlier, like whole utilization is a native value. Like who better to be giving that education out to the world than a native butcher? Right. So, sure. is there part of that that gets you up in the morning, like being well, coming from where you come from? And yeah, my you know my folks ran a calving operation up in the Dakotas for three generations, and the you know cattle industry is kind of in my lifeblood. And um, I'm like I love animals, and <laughs> I I want the best for best treatment for animals, and um, take uh, animal husbandry very seriously. Um, I tour kill facilities that try to utilize uh, Temple Grandin style, you know, really like traditional butchering, field butchering is a low stress, natural, you know, and what we're trying to do with modern technology is try to emulate that as much as possible and using technology to make sure these animals are, you know, kept in humane conditions, that they're being treated well. Um, you know, uh, I was listening to uh, someone speak yesterday about layerage and how important a lot of those aspects are. Those incremental stresses and things change the flavor because, you know, when we talk about turning muscle into meat is the process of rigor mortis, essentially, with ATP in the muscle. Um, so there is a lot of hormones and things that change that process. And so getting back to traditional butchering techniques, animal handling techniques, I think that's vital. And I think, you know, we have a lot to learn from our ancestors when it comes to things like that. Um, you know, in my, in my industry, on the retail side of things, it came from a time of industrialization in this country. And a lot of the same holdover kind of cuts, the way it was cut, um, come from packers. And that wouldn't be the, the way that, you know, animals would typically be broken down if you did it on the farm. Um, and did it for your own family. You would typically be seeming things. You wouldn't want to end up with a bunch of grind, you know, so you'd want some of these different cuts and stuff like that. And I just think that there's, there, there's a room for, for us to bring in some of those values and, uh, and explore those a little bit further. Absolutely. I think you can't really get into this kind of work, even if you're doing it from a, you know, industrial packer perspective without realizing how complex it is. And then as soon as you get into that complexity, you start going down in the rabbit hole and it does bring you back to indigeneity. It does bring you back to the ancestors, you know? So yeah, maybe next, next year's session could be like decolonizing your mind with butchery or something <laughs> like that, right? Love it. 
So uh, we have like five minutes and we wanted to make time for questions. So if there are any, I don't know how that works, Olivia, do you? Okay, so someone has a mic and if you have a question, just raise your hand. A comment? No, yeah, right up front. Yeah, from um, the beef that you have up there, can you tell how the, it was handled? I mean, can you there's tell no if it was there's stressed? There's no blood splash. Yeah, there's telltale signs, uh, typically femoral bleed. You'll see um, blood splash and things like that. Um, from what I've seen on this small you know, section of the hind quarter, um, there wasn't any blood splash or clotting. It looked like it had a good clean. That's one of the first things when I, when I started, I will grab that femoral vein and I'll massage it to see if there's any blood in there. Um, but the kill looks really good. The meat smells really good. It's got great texture, fiber. It's lean, but um, there's a whole lot more to beef flavor than intramuscular fat. Um, I always try to remind people that. Uh, but yeah, this, this is high quality beef. I, it's been a pleasure to cut it, cut it up for you guys. It could all be this nice. I'd be happy. Nice. That's a great, right. great question. Thanks. Is there other question or comment? So do you recommend a certain age of the beef to be butchered, older, younger, or just depends on what you're looking for? Yeah, most everything under, 30, you know, for USDA, 30 months is really that, that's the, the time period because, um, uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. Color is the main one, but, um, you know, the BSEs and things like that. So you can harvest uh, over 30 months. Uh, spinal cord has to be removed. The whole spinal column has to be removed. So you end up with a lot of boneless cuts, which some people don't like. They like those T-bones. They, they like those rib steaks. Um, you know, there are ways around it. I've, I've uh, had older beef in very common in Europe to uh, butcher animals that are seven, eight years old. And if you see uh, animals that have only uh, been fed grass, no grain diet, and have their lives extended to that amount of time, you really see the carrots and the color and the marbling, the very, very deep marbling, and you see that deep yellow fat. Um, you know, people have different opinions about the age of animals. It's definitely... Science would say the older the animal, the tougher the meat, the darker the meat, and things like that. But through aging and through cutting and, and uh, things like that, you can mitigate some of those things. Um, in South America, they butcher babies. <laughs> they're really young and very small. And because they're one of their biggest indicators is dark color. And uh, they love that really pale, pink, soft baby flesh essentially, and it's, um, it's, it's not strong. I don't find it has really strong beef flavor. Um, so I think at some point you kind of have to make decisions on um, that intersection of flavor, quality, tenderness, it all kind of has to make sense for, for your purposes. Um, you can do a lot with uh, good genetics, with proper treatment, a good abattoir facility, um, and then you know, knowing your meat packer, knowing your, your guys who are cutting your meat, Give them a phone call. Tell them to call me if you don't know what to ask. You know, I'm, I'm here to help too. So a, a lot of the nebulous vocabulary that is involved with this stuff, all of these cuts have several different names. Um, and it can get really difficult to navigate quickly. So um, those are things, you know, uh, that, that we could help out with. Other questions? Just real quick, everybody, these folks, all of our email addresses and business names are on the back of the resources sheet. So feel free to reach out after the fact. We would love to engage with you all individually. So, Yeah, and before we end, I just want a big round of applause for these guys because they're doing a lot. Thank you so much, Lee.